Southern Water Conservation District. I was the engineer there from 1981 to 1996, and I was in charge of doing all their efficiency work. I worked with the NRCS, with the, all the other water districts doing pump efficiencies. In the late 80s, we started doing a little drip research, and I was kind of amazed at what we were finding. We could grow on cotton, uh, compared to what they were doing with three gallons a minute, they were making them bales of acre on cotton. The first year we put drip in, had no idea what we were doing or how to manage it, and we went to three bales. And we started digging holes in July to look at what the weather pattern looked like for our first field day, and we were noticing we had a carrot with some uh, withered clover. And what we were doing, uh, we had four zones in that first one, and we were watering it six hours a day on each zone. That didn't look right, so I was also on the irrigation team back in the early 80s and we were looking at surge irrigation with Jerry Walker up here, Greg Sikora, uh, Minor Mountain down south. And uh, so I said, well, we'll just surge it. So I turned it on to surge it with a controller. And then in uh, September when we had our next field day, we dug another hole up to look at, you know, to show the weather pattern. And our weather pattern was a ball one. And that made more sense because it takes, you know, if you look at the fourth foot, Soil Moisture, which is another program I work with at the Water District, you don't see four foot root depth in cotton until you get into late August into September. So any moisture that's down there, it'll help you finish the crop, but it's not going to give you much help during the season. And if you're, for what water it was costing and how short it is, we were wasting a lot of water. Anyway, so the drip looked like it was going to work, and then in 1996, none of them offered me a position as district sales manager in West Texas, and I'm like, sure, I'll take uh, unfortunately, they didn't own the map because the, the definition apparently of West Texas was everything north of I-10, everything west of I-35, everything east of the Rockies <laughs> to Canada, and that was my territory. And I thought I put a lot of miles on them. Now I put more miles on them. They don't need to work with me now. Okay. Basically, one of the main things, and the, the big reason that drip irrigation works, and especially in this part of the world, is because we have a very high vapor pressure deficit. So any moisture that we get uh, from rainfall, surface irrigation, even humidity and dew in the morning, you lose it because during the day we don't evaporate that moisture. You get back like I'm doing sport down in the southeast, they don't have that problem. Or actually up in the Corn Belt also, they have high enough humidity, they don't have the evaporation. Limited water with evaporative water is the main thing that is getting the most crop from every drop that you can find. When we design systems, these are the components we first look at. Crop, number one, water that you've got available, uh, the run lengths, pressures, whether the wells are uh, equipped correctly, do you need to add booster pump, the soil condition, crop spacing. And crop spacing is really important when you're putting drip systems. It's not like a pivot where you can change up your row space a little bit. If you put drip on 40 and you decide to go on 30s, you have a problem. You can do it, but you're always going to be driving on tape if you follow the rows. If someone switches, like from if they've got drip on 40s and they switch to 30s, and I've got several that have done that, I've got them going across the rows. We don't like to bring water to the surface with drip, so if they go across the rows, that mask it, you can't see it. Which are also not driving. tool to deliver not only the water but also plant nutrients and that to me is the the saving water is, is huge but the ability to spoon feed the nutrients <coughs> in fact uh, even the pump I'm using now I can put out from 0 0.012 gallons an hour up to 33.5 gallons an hour with the same injection pump just by speeding it up and now I can put chemicals out without having to pre-mix them in a tank because my you know, when I get the volume right, I can inject it parts per million. I can tie it into the flow meter so that I can actually put parts per million out if I want to. But I can I can follow that consumptive use curve on the nitrogen, phosphorus, all those things through the growing season. And if I get held out, everything I've got, extra fertilizer, is sitting in the tank by the filter step. For 
protection chemicals also. We got labeled a product a couple years ago for rodents. There was a mistake in the label and they've lost it. Hopefully they'll have it back this year, but we'll get into that later. And again, the main thing is to minimize our losses, to keep uh, all of the, the water, nutrients, and all that productive at a rate that is going to enhance crop yield. And again, it's low volume, frequent irrigation. Most people. In fact, I just got through designing the system in, uh, in Oregon, and the guy was saying, well, how long, you know, are we gonna water, you know, like once a week? You know, how, how I said, uh, about four times a day. He's like, what? I said, yeah, four times a day. And uh, again, with the automation, you, you just, it never shuts down, but instead of putting out large doses of anything, I'm trying to create that ball, not the carrot. So by the multiple applications a day, I can do that and the plant never has to look for water, and especially cotton. Cotton really is susceptible to having the wet and dry cycle. That's when you start to shed fruit. Low operating pressure, this is actually up now, seven to 17. Most of the tapes now are up to 22 pounds, and then they've got some other tapes that are pressure compensating that uh, really I only need six pounds to maintain, to keep the diaphragm, and then it's gonna put out either a 0 0.16, 0 0.26, and they're also anti-siphon. I'll get to that later. <coughs> and the first dripper that was ever designed was actually in, at, where Netafim started down in Hot Serene, which is in the Negev Desert, south of uh, in the southern part of Israel. And in 1958, they sent a group down there. They started a kibbutz, and they said, we need an outpost down here. You'll need to make this functional. Well, they got down there, and there were, they had water, but they had no way to put it out in the desert. And some guy decided if he got some spaghetti tubing, he could measure the flow, or he could measure the friction loss. And he said, okay, how much pressure do I have to have on the tube to get a given flow? And he could calculate that. So he went along and he cut all these tubes and stuck them in the drip line into that hose, wrapped it, taped it, epoxied it to the, to the tubing, and then they put the one meter spacing on that wrap and they put that out. And then they found out they could grow anything and they could grow it year round. In 1963, Netafim started producing enough to sell it to other people by 1965. <coughs> excuse me. They were selling it commercially. Whenever you look at the efficiency of a drip system, the only thing I really care about is the uh, flow variation. If I've got an irrigation zone and I've got 100,000 drippers in a zone, the flow variation is gonna take the, the difference between the lowest flow dripper and the highest flow dripper and compare that. And it, most of the system, in fact, all the systems that I put in are gonna be less than 10%. So if you take a dripper that's putting out 0 .13, 0 0.13 gallons an hour, what's 10% of that? It's 13 thousandth of a gallon an hour. That's pretty small. Every dripper on the planet follows this equation. You've got your, a constant, which is basically what's gonna determine what your flow rate is. Your pressure times the exponent x. x is the critical value in this in this equation because the lower x is the more uniform and less pressure sensitive the drippers are here's five different products the only thing really different these all are the same if you look at they all say that it's a 0.2 dripper except for this one this is another netafin product the two netafin products are at the bottom but that flow variation being that small you can see what your flows are at different pressures. And the stars are where you need to have one and a half feet per second uh, flow velocity out the end of the tapes, and that's the pressure that you need. Look at the difference between the top three and the two on the left on those pressures. That's huge. It's also gonna determine, because of the difference, the, the, the higher the rate of uh, 
the steeper the angle, the more pressure sensitive and the less uniform your crop's going to be. <coughs> this is an example of a design that I had done in Colorado this last year. Uh, they changed on me midstream. We started off with seven zones on 40s, and then they decided that they wanted to go, or uh, seven zones on 40s, and then they decided they wanted to go to 60s. Actually, that's backward. This is the 60s. This was the ones on on 40s, and I had to change the drippers and everything to, ma to match the flows that they had. But the dripper in the line, because that's what you're paying the money for. That's your, your investment is buried in the ground, so you need to make sure that that's where you look and uh, look for the product that's going to best suit what you're trying to do. Underneath, it doesn't look anything like it does on top, because on top it's just dirt. And it can be pretty scary underground. A large cross-sectional area is going to determine the filtration and the clog resistance of your dripper. You take, in order to determine a dripper, a turbulent flow dripper, you take it has to be one seventh, you're only filtering one seventh of the smallest cross sectional dimension of that dripper. You take an Edifim dripper, it's a big square. Uh, a lot of those have gone away, but some of those old tape drippers, they had a real wide flow path, but they're, they were real narrow. And this is the supposed to play but it's not doing it. A swing and a miss. And I, st I started to put this at the top and I probably should have but we were discussing pump efficiencies earlier. And uh, I thought I'd better bring something out because this is one thing I've started doing with the systems I'm putting in is checking their well. Because you've got to know what your flow is to start with. And I've been doing a lot of pump efficiencies for the NRCS for their CSP program. And this is one of my drip customers and uh, I checked his wells. $551 per acre foot is what that well was costing to run. And he had no idea, no idea. The pump efficiency was 8%. I don't usually do this, but when I tested that well, the first thing I did was turn it off and close the gate valve. In fact, that was my recommendation. Okay, we've got the cross-sectional dimension, that's going to determine the filtration. This is the insurance policy that you have for your drip system. If people want to skimp on, on filtration, I'm done. I can't guarantee the system is going to last any time if they don't filter it properly. And as we've noticed here lately, especially on the South Plains, as we pump, you know, as our wells fall off, all the wells, when they first drilled them, they pumped a lot of sand. They bailed a lot of sand out, and there's cavities down there. Well, now those cavities are starting to slough off. And if you don't have filtration that's, that can handle the sand, number one, and the fact that it varies, it can be clear as a bell one day, and then in the middle of the night, because it never does it when you're there, you can have sand slough off and hammer a filter station. If you don't have safeties in place to do it and a way to stop that sand, it can hammer and destroy your filter and all that water ends up, all that water and sand ends up in the drip system. And I've got one that I've impossible to clean up over at Alton because they put a screen filter in. And you never save money by putting in less filtration. And then I've had this too. <laughs> well, it was flushing all the time, so I just took the discs out. Okay. <laughs> Bad idea. And it's, again, the system was salvageable, but we still got sand in the system. If you go dig it up, it feels kind of like a beanbag chair. The good news is the sand is water bearing. It's pure Ogallala. So, my personal preference for filtration is disc filters. You look at the filter on the left, 
that's actually supplying the clean water that's coming into this filter on the right. And the way this works, the spline assembly that those discs sit on have holes at an angle to the disc, okay? That clean water, when it comes in, it hits that nozzle and the, the hydraulic pressure is all operated on the, on, by pressure. The pressure picks that cap up about a half inch, which releases those discs, and then those jets from the inside high pressure jet it and spin it so we've got inertia and the jetting of the water to clean it. And the disc filter for the most part, as soon as that disc starts to spin, and you can see that's pretty violent, 10 seconds. Once it starts to, f starts to spin, 10 seconds and you're done. Compared to a media filter, these will use at least 10% or less of the water to flush than media filters. They come in various configurations. <coughs> this is one from back in the uh, early 2000s. Again, we've got our, our, sec our primary filter on this one is actually hydrocycling, and we're using those to spin the sand out before it gets to the filter. And then this one takes it down to the 120 mesh filtration. I used to have issues with this because this is just backwards. We were taking the dirty water in the bottom, up through the deal, then the clean water comes out the top. Well, the clean water comes out the top of the hydrocyclones. The clean water comes out here, and I'm having to run it down to go back in here, then back up here, and then back down. And I got tired of that, and finally one year I just took a picture of it. I flipped uh, one for Junior Anduho over here at Sunray, and then I did one more down at Olton, and then when I did that one, I took a picture sent it to him, I said, wouldn't this be a good idea? Everyone I've gotten since has been upside down and it's right. Makes a lot cleaner installation. Again, here we're pumping, we can't supply, with multiple wells you typically are gonna need a booster pump. A lot of people will try to do it without one, but if you go measure your flow with and without a booster pump, you're losing a lot of water when you're trying to pressure a system up with the well because it's hard to get all the wells that you've got balanced to make that happen. Again, you'll always see a ChemCheck valve, the new hydrocyclones, and NetFM, uh, I guess four years ago, came out with the, the low pressure uh, disc filters. If you'll see the gray, ca gray caps, those are also acid resistant, but they also, this will spin in, at about 25 to 30 PSI. And this whole assembly will finish flushing in a minute and 20 seconds. And here's one I worked, worked on, had an issue with down in uh, McAllen, oh, about a month ago, uh, on a big orchard, there isn't grapefruit. But this is the big brother to that one. Each one of these, this is a 1,200 gallon a minute filter, and there's two of them, so that's 2,400 gallons a minute filtration in a disc filter. And you'll also notice the flow meter. I used to argue with them when I was at the water district because they didn't want to put flow meters in. And I'm like, how can you possibly not put a flow meter in? The most important piece of information you need to know in order to make an informed irrigation decision is how many gallons a minute I've got. And if you don't know that number, you're done. In fact, I used to tell people when I'd do efficiency tests, they'd go, well, how much do you charge to do this? I said, well, we're doing it for free, but if I was charging, I'd charge the difference between what you tell me your well pumps and what it actually pumps, and I'd be rich and retired. <laughs> <coughs> Here's another one of the Apollos. This one I put in last year down at uh, Hondo, growing corn. And this guy, I told you about watering like we did, like to do, watering it every few, you know, multiple times a day. This guy's got that well right there, pumps 2,000 gallons a minute, and he waters. He's got two pivots in the drip, and the way he's watered it since he put it in, he waters one pivot, it's nozzled for 1,400 gallons a minute, then he waters the other pivot for 1,400 gallons a minute, and then he puts all that water to the drip, and we do all the zones at one time per day, and then he switches and does it again. Needless to say, he's not making great yields. That's the same system. They have a little problem with theft down there, so they've caged in their filter station. And this is another one that we put in. This is on sugar cane. And uh, 
the water we're pumping in this system comes out of a canal. Our biggest issue is fish and algae and floating debris. We actually have a screen, a very large screen catching the big pieces before it goes into this system. And again, here's one I actually put in when I was with Netafin back in 97. We're using, uh, this was a corn research block at Garden City, Kansas, and that's actually the primary lagoon from a feedlot at, at Garden City. We're using feedlot waste through disc filters and through drip, drip tape. And the drip tape today is better than it was in 97. We've made significant improvements in the dripper. And here's one that we actually put this one down as a, <coughs> oh, between Gatesville and uh, Hamilton. We're pumping out of the Leon River. And uh, we didn't have any power down there and we got lucky because when they drew down out of Iraq, they had all these generator trailers and uh, it's a 47,000 watt generator, and we bought it for $4,000. And the trailer's worth a bunch. I mean, you can't see it, but I think those are 16 bolt tires on it. It's big military grade, everything on that deal. And on the other panel on the side, on the other, it's got every output known to man for AC, AC power, even down to a doorbell if you wanted to do it. But uh, mounted the filter on that, and we've got a, a submersible pump on a skid wrapped in well screen that we slide off in the river. Gaikon makes the pump that we use, used on this one. But we can actually pull this out. As soon as we're done irrigating, we can pull it out of the river bottom. So we don't have to worry about flooding, and it does flood. And then I put this one in Idaho three years ago, I guess now. This is filtering dairy waste, and it's going to pivots. And, uh, the amazing thing with this one, the state was on them pretty hard because of their phosphorus loading. It was excessive. And as soon as we got this filter in and started filtering the, the, the water, their phosphorus loading dropped by 90% because the phosphorus was in the solids. And so the state now is off their back about phosphorus loading. At 90% at reduction, they're good to go. And this one, because it's actually got two pots more than it needs for the flow that we've got, and that's how you size filters. The dirtier the water, the more filtration you're gonna have to have. But on this one, because the water is, well, I'll be nice, really crappy, literally and figuratively, I've set this one up so it never stops flushing. It's flushing the water back to the uh, beginning of the lagoon, so it's recirculating the water and it has a chance to settle out again. But I also, all of these valves, all these filters have a flush valve. And I didn't want the water in the flush valves either, so we actually put an air compressor on this one, and it's, in the, it's sitting over there on the other side, but every valve in that thing is running on air pressure, not on water. So when it triggers, it's just, it, they're actuated with water, with air instead of water, so we don't get the crappy water into the valve. Eventually that causes an issue because of the organics and the growing in it. And then they used to build these on trailers in the valley using those media tanks. The trouble is when your water quality gets bad in a hurry, and it does, that's typical down there because the water will be clean for weeks and all of a sudden you get a rainfall event and they start letting more water out of Falcon. Well, that extra water that they, when they increase that flow down the river, now you get all that silt and stuff coming down. And it was slamming the uh, media filters shut because they take so long to flush. This thing flushes again. This one's flushes in a minute, and it can keep flushing as long as it's not as long as it's in an alarm state. Too much pressure loss, it'll keep flushing. The media tanks get so stopped up before they can finish a flush that they quit. These don't do that. And the, the sugar cane one, they had to put burglar bars around it because people were stealing everything off of it. And then the last application I've been using with DISC is down in Houston on a subdivision. We talked about that at lunch today, but this is what a 6,000 gallon a minute filter station looks like with really bad water. They're pumping out of lakes, and they're, uh, this particular subdivision has uh, 900 acres of parks. And they're watering all their parks and the esplanades and the grass between the streets and the houses and all that is watered with this. 
but it was pretty ingenious because all when they made their lakes, they didn't have lakes down there, it's just coastal prairie. They built that up, built the houses all up, they built those nice parks and lakes and ponds through the subdivision, which is their water supply, but it's also their flood stores. So like in Harvey, these subdivisions didn't have any problem with the water because they had storage for it. And then that FM also makes me, <coughs> excuse me, media filters. And uh, these, unlike most of them, these are just full of sand. A lot of them require gravel at the bottom. These don't. And that's a screen filter. Seriously, that's what a screen filter does. If you ever tried to, uh, you want to know how a screen filter works, get some spaghetti, make sure it's wet, and then go up to your screen door if you have one still. And when you'll push on it, you'll notice that you can push it through the screen. And that's why I don't use screen filters. All these wells pump some algae, and a screen filter is not going to stop it. It gives you two-dimensional filtration. And they make self-cleaning screens. And I'm like, if I need a filter, if I don't need a filter, I'll use a screen. Otherwise, I'm going to use something else. And again, media tanks, you can get as big as you want. These particular tanks, they have a new version of this now, but these are the only corrosion-proof media tank made. It's basically Kevlar on the outside with a poly molded inside. And there's nothing in there that can corrode. And this is what the trailers used to look like. Okay, I can, that filter that replaced that, I can move that around by myself. Each one of those tanks, just the sand in those tanks weighs 1,500 pounds. So there's 4,500 pounds. And then if you look at the, the weight of the tank on those, it's not too bad, but it, you're not moving them. Okay, now I won't put a system in that's manual because I, the guy is never going to be happy with it. The valve stations I put in, I'm going to make sure, number one, I've got a pressure relief, a continuous acting air relief on every riser, and then at the end of the, end of, end of the main lines and at the low valve station, I put drain so I can drain the system and I can flush the system and they're automatic. They can be either 12 volt AC, or excuse me, 24 volt AC where I run wires to them, or I can get, use DC latching. Here's one with the DC latching. In fact, that's out here. And the way these valves work, you've got a solenoid and a pressure regulator. And then on each zone, you can actually set different pressures if you want to. Typically in a zone you're not going to need to unless you've got some pretty severe uh, differences like say you're in a pivot corner and you've got real short rows and long rows. You don't need as much pressure if you've got some short rows in there because the short rows will back feed the long rows because it's manifolded on both ends. First thing to look at when you're doing a drip system though, after you know what amount of water you've got, is you've got to know what your soil is. Uh, is it a silty clay? Is it sandy clay? Is it sandy? Uh, what's the instantaneous infiltration rate? Uh, what's my uh, volume I can hold in inches per foot? another valve station. Again, he talked earlier about human damage. We call it biped damage, where they actually came up and they hit this with a tractor. Again, the other thing that's not only required, uh, in some places where they have them at the well, you wouldn't think you'd need one. I still put one on because there's no way to over-protect to over the aquifer that we're pumping out over the rivers and streams that we're pumping water out. If your water quality is bad, and I've got one of those in this system, in this one, you can see my bolts are rusting, but NetFM actually makes this check valve, and that thing has been in now since 2003, and the bolts are rusting, but it's, uh, it's all PVC. And the thing I like about it, if you'll see that little stem at the top, my fertilizer injector is wired through that, so if I don't have any flow, that stem's not up, my fertilizer injector can't come on. 
so I can't dump it into an open system. Air vacuum relief is another thing that's going to be very important. At the high point of your pipelines, you need one on every place you bring a riser up for an irrigation uh, valve assembly. Uh, upstream and downstream of the valves on the flush valve. And again, this used to play, but it does need more. This is a continuous acting air relief. It, under pressure, it will actually let the air out while it's running. You see this little flap right here? Air is not going to close this, but when this floats up, it, it seals it with the gasket, and then there's a little flap, and there's a little slit at the top. And as air builds up in that, since that deal is floating, when it starts to drop just a little bit, it opens that little flap and it burps the air out of that system. So it keeps the air out. And you'll notice I fixed a lot of pivots that were having to have booster pumps because that uh, pump stand will vapor lock. And all of a sudden, you s everything starts to surge. You can put one of those on there and smooth that out and get rid of it completely. And then location of your air relief. I've got to get this one to play. Notice the valve is closed. I have this exact scenario with one of my customers, and he blew his pipeline up three weeks in a row. And you can see all this air that's, this was kind of hard to do all this and hold the phone at the same time. But you can see what that air has done to my flow path down that hill. And in this, in the field condition, we had 35 feet of fall. And it takes it a while, but it finally works. But the problem is that air relief needed to be on that. Well, it came out straight. And at the particular situation that they had, they had an air relief, but it was on a pipe. And then there was a, a union. And then there was a, 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 oh, a butterfly valve that was open. And then it went to the underground. But it's, it couldn't let the air out. So I went down and put a cap on the pipe and put that monstrosity and the son thought it looked funny so he painted it in John Deere green so it looked like a cactus. But we've got a three inch air relief valve on the pipe, a continuous acting to keep all the air out, put a pressure gauge and a pressure relief valve and it turns out we didn't need the pressure relief valve. The thing never runs pressure up there anymore. It pressurizes the pivot just going down the hill. But we stopped blowing the pipe up because we got rid of the air. Have you ever seen one drown? This was confusing. I had to put a brand new drip system in down at Idaloo, and every time the system would change valves, that air relief would start <laughs> blowing water. And it, again, I'm, I'm watering three on this field three times a day, three valves at a time, five minutes apart, so the valves are changing. There's what, three, six, nine, nine times a day this air, <laughs> air relief is doing this making a mess. And what it is, it's called drowning. The ball in that air relief, when the valve would change, the pressure would drop, the ball would start to fall, and then the water would get back up, up on top of it. It would just suspend that ball with pressure on it all the way around it, and it wasn't seeping. And you could go up there and tap it and solve the problem. But you had to go tap it to make it stop after you made a lake. First time, it did that for a while. It goes, something's wrong. Well, yeah. Change the air relief, fix the problem, the continuous acting one. How many of y'all have drip in here? Good. Uh, how many of y'all have ever seen an installation? Get rid of your what? Get, all, get rid of all your residue. Right? Every time you see an installation, it's on black soil. Oh, I know. That's just nuts. But This is one I was working with the guys in Arkansas this last year. And you're right. First thing they did was got rid of all the residue. And they have all these really high organic soils.
That one's going in at 14 inches. Why is that going so slow? Must be an old computer. That was a very old plow, but I like the 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 pipe at the bottom. Made a nice way to set the depth that it didn't change as you went through the field. And it packed the row right behind it as you were going along. It, right at the first it was tough, but after it got yeah. going, it smoothed it out. Which you need to do to keep the rodents out. And that's the other thing. If you ever put a drip system in, you follow the tractor with the plow with the tractor to pack the rows. The one I just got finished in Hondo, the guy knew this from last year, but this year he goes, ah, it'll be all right. He had other stuff he wanted to do, not that he had to do, but so he waited four days. And to date, he's fixed about 300 leaks, and they're all rodent damage because it was wet when they put the tape in. And uh, you could look in and see the tape, and the rodents got in it, and it's, he's almost done. It's what out. Mice or? Mice. If you pack it, you know, the mice aren't a problem. In fact, on my plow now, I've added a tube on the back, and we actually mix a cocktail up that we inject when we're putting the tape down. The only problem with that, we can't fix leaks for two weeks after we put the stuff down. But the stuff runs the rodents out of the field, so that's a good thing. Drink the cocktail. What's that? Trade secret. Trade, trade secret. Okay. <laughs> but it's all legal. As far as you know. <laughs> no, I don't do anything with the chemical that's off label. And the main reason I had one of my customers uh, had a chemical, I can't remember, it was Lorsban. Lorsban at one time was labeled for drip. But then they lost the label for drip. Well, he thought, well, I used it last year, I'll just go ahead and keep using it. Well, then he calls and he's got some clogging issues. And it, the Lorsban, when they changed the label, it wasn't because of the Lorsban, it's because the, the the formulation that other stuff in the label was not compatible with the drip and it stopped up, it was uh, precipitate and it precipitated and it got in the drippers and stopped it up. Took me about two weeks trying all the different things that you can put through a drip system to clean it to figure out what would actually start to dissolve that stuff out. But, and again, you can see here we got the tractors packing it right behind the installation plow. And depth of, in, depth of application of the tape is the other question. Those that have drip in here, how deep is your tape? 13. 13? 10. 10. If you're germinating, this is at 10 inches. And this is on flat. If you're at 10 inches, there's 4,188 4, cubic inches in that sphere with a radius of 10 inches. If you drop down two inches, that goes from 40, say 4,200 to 7,200 cubic inches. It's the volume of a ball. If you go to 14 inches, it's 11,500 cubic inches. Just like adding the tower on your pivot, you get a lot more acres. You, you add an inch of depth, it adds a lot more water that it takes to get water to the surface for germination. So that's something to look at. If you're in an area, if, you, if, you, if germination isn't an issue, you can put it a little deeper. Uh, if it is an issue, you might want to think about a little shallower. The downside is a little shallower, you're going to have more trouble with rodents. And then the difference between either 30s or 40s and uh, 60s or 80s. In 11, a lot of the guys with 80s, they never got a crop started because they couldn't get the water to the surface. It was 100 degrees in May and the wind was blowing the whole time. It was cooking the moisture out of the soil because you're moving it with capillarity before it could ever get to the, to the seed. The guys on 40s, they're right under it, they could get it up there. And if they were 10 inches, they could get, it, was, it wasn't an issue. 
but you, when you move out to that 60s or the 80s, 60s isn't too bad. In fact, 60s actually has an application now because a lot of the, uh, not a lot, but some of the systems I'm working designs on right now, they're growing, uh, now that hemp is legal, they're growing hemp, and they're growing that on a five by five space. And I'll show you some pictures of what that's looking like later. But that's, you know, the other thing to look at, if germination is not a problem, go every other row, it's gonna save you some money. Uh, from an insurance standpoint, it doesn't cost twice as much to put the system on every row. But whenever you're putting a system in, the other thing you have to think about is what crops are you going to grow and what might you grow. I put a system in in Idaho, and the guy told me that he wanted to put it on 40s because he was going to just grow alfalfa. Well, so we went to eat one night, and we were sitting up there, and I'm kind of probing what his rotation is because I know he's not all, all the time alfalfa. He goes, no, nah, he'll go alfalfa three or four years, and he'll switch and go to corn and then he'll go to potatoes for one year and then he goes back to alfalfa. Well the potatoes was a kicker and those were on 36 inch spacing so the drip tape had to be 36 to match his potato spacing. So we have a drip system on 40s and you're saying you can plant against the rows? You can. What about like diagonally? Wouldn't that be fine? It's as long as you're not ripping. If you rip, that's a bad thing, but if you're not, yeah, it doesn't really matter. A lot of the systems early were put in that way. They put it in to make sense uh, uh, from, an hydrologic, from a hydro hydraulic standpoint because you want to go downhill so that you're losing uh, pressure due to friction, but you're gaining it due to elevation change. And then they would farm across it. They did the same thing on the terraces. A lot of that was done that way, but yeah, you can go diagonally as long as you're not ripping it. In fact, uh, I've got a lot of guys now that put it in on 40s now. I say a lot, there's nine of them that put it in on 40s initially, and now they've, they're farming on 20s. With GPS, they've actually built a 20-inch stripper that's got individual row units. In fact, McCloy's over here at, uh, at Stanette has some of those. And with that 20-inch stripper, when they put the tape down, when they, since they put the tape down with GPS, when they plant, they're planting 10 inches either side of the drip tape. And I should have put a 20 inch spacing in here because that's an amazing thing. The, the reason the 20 inch makes a huge difference, I didn't really had appreciate it until about three years ago when one of my customers contracted with Monsanto, they wanted to grow some seed blocks, test blocks. So they leased three zones off his drip system, but they wanted it on 40s. Well, he hadn't put it on 40s in 10 years. But he was only going to have 40 acres of cotton on that field, so he went ahead, since they were going to put it on 40s, he went ahead and put his on 40s. And again, he's just he's right over the tape, so it's no, no big deal. Two miles away, he's got another field that's also on 40s, and, but he planted it on 20s. They planted the same day, same variety. The yields were within 20 pounds of each other. The stuff on 20s was done three weeks quicker. That plant from the table was only about that tall. You gotta think the plant population, but you've also got all first position bowls. When he took it to the gin, the cotton on 20s was worth 13 cents a pound more than the cotton on 40s, times, times 4.2 bales. At, at four bales, that's $260 an acre difference in fiber quality. That's huge. And being out three weeks quicker, avoiding getting into October in the rain and the cool. You're maturing at a higher temperature so you get better fiber quality. That's the kicker with cotton up here, that's huge. Again, when you put it in, the first thing you do is pile the tape in. Second thing is cut the tape with a ditcher. And I took this because this was a mistake. A lot of the people that put drip in, most of them still today are doing the same thing. Your main line's over here, the sub-main sits on the outside, and then they're arching the drip tape up over the main line pipe and into the field. You can see that's kinked. Haven't done anything yet, and when they installed it, right here, that's kinked in the, in the ditch. That's gonna be a kink from now on, which means that row's not gonna get water. To fix this, what they do is they walk along with a hook or someone in the ditch, and they pull this back to straighten that up, and then 
with the guy standing in there or holding it with a hook on the outside to fill that up. And I'm like, no. 2005, I started putting in an elbow. I can move my pipe, my mainline pipe goes to the outside, my sub-main pipe goes to the inside. It comes up, I use the arch of the tubing because it comes in a coil. It gives me some flexibility. The pipe moves a little bit when I'm putting it in. I make sure that that's down a little bit. And this poly actually sticks in way past here. So the, it's sitting on a ledge, it can't kink at all. And my kinks went to zero. Again, the flush valve at the end of the line on the ends of the on the bottom end of the field, they're they're manifolded also, which is why this makes it work so well. Because when you're running, you actually it's all one big loop system, and you're really about the only pressure, only difference you can have if you don't run too far is the difference in elevation. Again, electrically controlled valves. And on my systems, on every supply line, on every sub main, there's a flush valve. There's not many people that are doing that. And I can't not do it. Because once you put a system in and get the lines clean that first year, when you go back and, you, and you're flushing the system at the end of the season, I'll skip to that in a minute. Dan Krieg put this uh, table together, measuring the evaporation rate off of uh, clay soils, sandy soils, and, and silt loam. And if you'll notice, the clay, days after wetting, and the percent of whatever the potential ET was. So on day one, it's 100%. So if you've got four tenths of an inch a day and evaporative losses, you're gonna lose four tenths on day one. On day two, you're gonna lose about 68%. Day three, about 55%, and on down for 10 days. If you're watering with a pivot and dry ground and you're putting a half inch on, you're gonna be out of water somewhere in here. How much did you put in for irrigation? talked about this, what are you growing, what do you want to grow in the future? And that was my point with probing the guy to find out what he had done as far as what his rotation was. Because it's kind of like this hemp thing. I never in my wildest dreams thought people would be growing hemp, but now that it's legal, they're growing it all over the country. And uh, like the five by five spacing seems to be about probably 60 to 70% of the fields that are going in. And is your system capable of making that? It's like I learned on, on grapes. Grapes actually are supposed to be right brain and left brain, according to a study that they did in Australia for years. And if you want a grape to start making sugar, if you're watering it, you actually have two systems. You've got one drip line on one side of the, of the rows and then another drip line on the other side, but they don't ever water together. And that way, when you want it to stress, you can stop watering it on one side the roots on that side think, well, I'm getting running short of water. I need to start making sugar. And you're still giving it enough water to supply what it needs to make the good grapes and the, with good, but it also triggers it to grow sugar. So if you're doing grapes, you can actually mix and match that setup. But mainly it's the row spacing. And if you do decide to do something different, make sure that you can go across the rows with whatever spacing. And the guys I've got that do that, I actually measure the field and measure their equipment so that I put the, the, all the equipment is about two rows out past where their equipment is. So when they're doing across the rows, they don't have to worry about peeling out everything when they make a pass. And then the crops you can grow. This was corn in Kansas. Uh, hard red winter wheat down at Deming, New Mexico. Actually, that's Columbus. In fact, that road on the other side, there's a little two-strand barbed wire fence down there, and that's the Mexican border. 
and that made 128 bushels. Well, the guy standing in that wheat right there, he's six seven. <laughs> that tells you anything about how tall that wheat is. And that's in Olton. In Arizona, that's a Durham wheat. Potatoes. And I'll show you this again in a little bit. If you'll notice this, because they didn't want to dig this with the potatoes, instead of putting it in permanent, they put disposable drip tape down. And this is lay flat tubing that they basically just punch a hole in and run a, like a, it's a, like a needle in your arm. They stick a tube in there and they water it with the drip system. And it's valves on the surface, but just like it would be on your, in your field. But they didn't want to dig the potatoes. And it turns out the guy that grows potatoes they told me they don't dig that deep. In fact, I'm doing one right now in Wyoming, and uh, they actually got it installed this last fall and had to go start it about three weeks ago. They didn't tell me they had snow on the ground when I left. I didn't take enough clothes, but they're growing sugar beets. And, uh, but their sugar beet set up, and my family farm at Dimmit, and they used to grow sugar beets, and I never saw a rig like his, but it's all tracked. And uh, he carries, there's no trucks in the field ever, and the machine carries about 20-something pounds of sugar beets before he has to dump it. And that's what we're shooting for at the end is uh, that kind of cotton yields. I got to take a break here and tell you a story about because this picture got me in trouble. I took my son to daycare on Monday. He was four. And on Monday, Monday afternoon when I went and picked him up, the daycare lady said, I need to talk to you right now. Okay. And I walked in the house and she goes, in the bedroom. This is serious. Okay. So we go in the bedroom. She goes, close the door. Okay. We walk in there and she goes, before I talk to Patty, my wife, she goes, I need to talk to you and find out what the deal is. Goes, what are you talking about? Brandon told me that you took him to a stripper on Saturday. <laughs> That's my four year old. <laughs> Not four anymore, but. You had a good time? He had a blast. <laughs> and again, the, the thing that gets with cotton, the first time people start growing cotton on drip, the hard part is getting them to water long enough because everybody else has a magic date when they cut that irrigation off. And with drip system, I don't need that magic date. I can slow down the irrigation. I don't have to stop it. And I can go down with the controller systems I set up, it's all automated. They're going to turn all the wells on. It'll water for how long I tell it, and they're going to turn it off. I can set the days on. So when we get to the end, I'm probably going to irrigate to 80% open bowl, cracked or open, 80%. But what I'm doing is exactly what you see in this field. Look at the bowls in the top of this plant. They're huge. But you can once you get the plant to shut down and you can fill that bowl up without stressing it and dropping them, that's, that's huge. This guy, his best yield ever was a bale and a half. Before drip. Now his average is four six. And he was doing the soil is really really sandy, and his irrigation is just surface. Where is that at? Uh, Wilson, southwest of Lubbock or southeast of Lubbock. It's real sandy. There's a high tension line. Could never put a sprinkler up. And uh, he was putting twenty. He's in that channel. You know, any of y'all know about the Slayton Channel? It's this. It's an old river that runs from Slayton back to the southwest. And uh, if you're in the channel like he is, he's got two wells, one 454 that pumps 900 gallons a minute and one 413 Chrysler that pumps 830 gallons a minute. One of the wells we abandoned, we moved over about 20 yards from a well he abandoned because it only pumped 20 gallons a minute and moved over the 50 yard, 50 yards, I guess, and got in the bottom of that channel and the hole is 200 and 80 feet deeper than it is where that other well is. And he's in that, and that channel has steep sides and it's a mile wide. And it's very, very coarse. And, but since we drilled the new well, so we've got the two wells, we've gone from 28 inches and the most water we've ever pumped is 16 inches per acre in a year. So we actually did, we saved, what's that, 14 inches? No, 12 inches. We saved a foot of irrigation. 
and that was in Australia with those broadcast strippers. And that was a bad day. Time for a break? Okay, are you all ready? I tried to get that video loaded of the cotton stripper, and I've got it on my phone. If anybody wants to watch it, it's loaded, so we can show it later. But Anyway, this guy was having a really bad day. At least he got his, got it out of the stripper. In fact, I was kind of surprised, but I put a system in for the experiment station, and they don't allow wire flags in the field anymore for all their plot work that they're doing because the wire flags, once again, the wind never blows here, but when it blows the flag off, you can't seem to pick them up, and they get in a stripper, they burn the stripper down with the wire flag getting tangled in. This was over in New Mexico, over near Hatch. Uh, 1,800 sack onions next to... Uh, silage corn, chilies, watermelons. They actually, it's some kind of a, uh, it's an annual grass that they plant, but they do that, and I had never even thought about it, but before they started doing that, the little watermelon plants, when the wind would blow, it would, those plants would twist on that plastic. And it's like taking an artery and pinching it. The plant could never uh, use, send enough fluid through there to make very many watermelons because it would twist it and kink that, the stem. They started putting the windbreaks up and they solved the problem. Peanuts. We had some guys come in from South Carolina and they were talking about growing corn, or growing cotton rather. And we took them by the, uh, this was in, oh, probably November. And we took them by the cottonseed oil mill there in Lubbock and there's a cottonseed just as far as you can see. And one of the guys said, crap, I hope y'all never start growing peanuts. <laughs> and then we went over to Seminole and we were growing 6,000 pound peanuts on drip. The trick with peanuts though is to pick a Spanish variety that'll that'll peg through a two by four because the since you never wet the surface, pegging is an issue. This is actually where Netafim started in the Negev Desert and that's cabbage. Uh, one inch annual rainfall. This is two actually dual line hard hose. You can see there's a piece of it sticking out over there. But there because it's the soil type there would actually be classified as active dune. They don't bury anything. They lay it out, they've got it, it's on 10,000 foot coils, and they lay the drip line out on the surface, they hook it up on, they've got the above ground manifolds, they hook it up. At the end of the year, they actually have a, uh, a little trailer that hooks on the three point on the tractor with the PTO, and it takes that spool, and they go bring that spool over and tie it on, and it rolls it up from one end and drags it out of the field, and then when it gets to the next row, they come put a barb by barb coupler, and they just go till they fill up the 10,000 foot coil, then they drop it, and they haul that drip line back on what looks like a round bale hay haul, haul and trailer. And they park it in the barn the next year they come back and they just lay that stuff out the same year after year. How many years can they use it? The stuff they're putting out, they'll get six to seven years. It's a, a 50 wall, it's pretty heavy. But that dragging it in and out, in fact, I've got guys now, in fact, one of the, the guys that's growing hemp in Kentucky this year we're using the 25 wall, and he's hoping to get four years out of it. Uh, what manual? Uh, it comes in a 638, 875, 990, so up to an inch. In his case, with the, with the pressure compensating dripper, it's actually not only pressure compensating, it's also anti-siphon. And that has opened up the drip market to a lot of areas that used to be unavailable because with a, drip, with a non pressure compensated dripper, you can go down a hill, you can go up a hill, you can go down and up a hill. You can't go up and over a hill. Because when you go up and over a hill, what happens is that top dripper now becomes your vacuum breaker. And it sucks in the mud that's in that, around that drip line. Well, as soon as it stops up, the next two drippers, either side of that one, on either side of the hill, they become the vacuum breaker until they stop up, and the next two become the vacuum breaker until it's stopped up on the hill. And 
it's, it pulls it in on the low pressure side of the dripper, it's hard to clean out. But the anti-siphon, the dripper actually closes and won't let it suck back. So now you can do that, go over a hill. And the one in Kentucky, that's what we're doing. We're going down the hill that's about 20 feet down and about another 15 foot up, and then it goes down about another eight feet on the other side. It just does that. But we can do that now with that dripper. And plus, we're only gonna put it down about four inches because he's gonna retrieve it. And that retrieval rig looks like a, kind of like a carrot knife. You get down under it and it just kind of lifts it up. And as it lifts that tape up, then it spools it as, you, as you're driving it, just rewinds it on a coil. And he's gonna, and he actually, when he, this is again, this is for hemp, but they plant transplants and all the transplants are, cl are cloned. And uh, the uh, rig that they've got is a four row transplanter. So what they're gonna do is they've moved over and they've actually got the plow set up now with a place to put an injection shank, a shallow injection shank that's four inches offset from that where that, where that transplant's gonna go. So when they're plowing the tape in, they're actually tr guide guys on the, on the rig uh, putting transplants in. So they're transplanting and putting the tape on the same time. Eventually they wanna put it permanent, but that's down the road a ways. But anyway, in that anti-siphon, it's also pressure compensating. So on that hill, I, you know, I told you earlier that the lower the exponent, the better the uniformity. The exponent on a pressure compens a truly pressure compensated product is zero. So that, that K value, that's no matter what the pressure is, that's what it puts out. And the dripper we're putting in on that one is 0.16 gallon an hour. And they make them in a 1.6, a 2.6, a 3.2. You can kind of match it, but you can also match your spacing. In fact, one of the systems I put in, we're growing trees, but we don't have extra water, and the trees run 10 foot centers. So when I ordered it, I've got three drippers that are 24 inches apart. And then from the center of that three to the center of the next three is uh, 10 feet, six inches. Because I need a little slack between them. And so when we roll it out, every tree gets three drippers. Uh, depends on the wall thickness. The, uh, the stuff that we normally put out, the 13 and a half mil, which is the normal drip tape thickness that we're using here, it's rated to operate continuously at 22 PSI. Uh, flush it, two atmospheres, you can take it up to 32 PSI. I know because I've tested it, the, te the burst pressure on the tubing is about 72 PSI. But you remember your curve, what the discharge is as you go up the curve, that's the other issue is what your flows are doing. Not necessarily the burst pressure. But I've actually had a system blow up because they didn't put pressure regulating valves in the field and somebody messed with the three of the valves and they turned them into the, not into the auto position, but they were somewhere in the middle and they didn't come on. And so three out of the five valves didn't come on and they put, and without pressure regulators on the valves, they put, when they got there, there was 100 pounds on the filter station, so we had at least that on the tape. We had some elevation down to the tape, but it was at least 100. And uh, we only had about, in each, in each zone, there was only about eight or 10 leaks in the deal where it blew the line because it blew it up. But it didn't blow all of it. There was just short pieces to fix, which kind of surprised me. Anybody guess what that is? Rice. And this is the other stuff. If, if people are interested in doing drip and they don't want to get, you know, don't want to go permanent right off the bat, or if you've got a high value crop that you want to grow, vegetables, most of this is done in vegetables. Netafim now makes a poly uh, manifold. This, uh, this one is a four inch and it can take up to like 26 PSI on this line. But on that old stuff where you actually had to cut a hole in the tubing and poke a piece of poly in there, this one has a half inch threaded deal that's pressed into that tube and you screw a, an elbow on there or a T if you put it in the middle and go both ways. And you can just hook up your tape like they did. This is a twist lock. And it's just twist locked on. And this again, this is only about three or four inches deep. And that's in Colorado. That's the hemp on five by five. It doesn't have to be, because the other trick is that the dripper's pressure compensating. So no matter what it does, that dripper puts out 0.16. If it goes downhill like that one in Kentucky, if it goes downhill 30 feet, the bottom one puts out 0.16, the top one puts out 
it has a diaphragm and it always puts out the same amount. With one exception, you can't run any dripper 24 seven and expect it to be pressure compensating because you will have, it's, a, it's an elastic deformation because it will come back. But the, the longer it's under pressure, it'll start to deform a little bit into the flow path and the flow starts to drop. And I uh, figured that out back in the 90s. The guy was running the system in California for two weeks at a time on uh, some, some uh, almonds. And his zones were huge, got big water. And we figured out that there was about a million drippers on that line that were watered at one time. And when you take a million drippers and you drop the flow on them, just a couple of hundreds on a million drippers, your flow substantially decreases over the, on that whole block. And all we had to do was turn the dripper off for a day and turn it back on and it was back normal. And this stuff, it's bizarre because once they grow this, this from, the, from that one to that one was a few weeks. It's only a 90 day crop. And they plant transplants. That's what it looks like right before harvest. And then they're harvesting it and hanging it like tobacco to dry for the CBD oils, what they're processing it for. They rented a, a hanger at the airport to put it in. You said that was planted by seedlings? Yeah, they plant transplants. In fact, when I was in South Carolina this last week and the, the guy that I was working with last year, he was talking about did not having a place to hang it and those hoop houses are really cheap. And I said, yo, look at that. Well, I went, I had talked to him on the phone when I got there this last week, he's got five hoop houses out there. And it turns out last year he paid a fortune for the clones because in the, they can't have THC, the THCs have to be really, really low. So they have to sample those, the plants, and they sampled the female plants to find out which ones had the low and they put, they separated the lows and that's their cloning, that's the ones they're gonna clone. So they've cloned those, the ones that came back low, they're cloned those. So now they've got a bunch of those and then when they get ready to plant, they're gonna have to clone about 60,000 plants off the ones that they've done. And that, that's a pretty expensive to buy, but them, I mean, they're just, it's a kind of the off season, so it's not a big deal for them. They clone the seed, like the seed. Yeah, because the seed, you can't, you don't want males. You only want females. <laughs> and you don't want low, to, low THC, so. <laughs> high in CBD. <laughs> they're higher in oil and really, really low in the THC, so. What's that? <laughs> okay, and this is, this is one thing that bites us here all the time, is how much water do I have to start with? And a lot of people will plant based on what they have in April and not what they're gonna have in August. And if we get rainfall during the summer, that's a good thing, but if we don't, that's a bad thing. I typically, when I design a system like the NRCS, the minimum is three gallons a minute per acre. When I'm designing a system, I would really rather do it on four gallons a minute an acre or up to four and a half. And the reason being, like most of the people in the South Plains are growing cotton. And I can grow on drip, I can grow a bale of cotton per gallon a minute per acre. Okay, so if I've got 100 acres and I can, I've got, uh, well, say I've got 400 acres, I'm gonna be three gallons a minute an acre. I've got 133 acres I can put in drip. And I'm gonna make three bales to the acre, okay? I'm gonna make 400 bales. Or I can put in 100 acres of drip with four gallons a minute an acre and I can make 400 bales. So I can put, uh, what's that? A fifth less, no, a fourth less drip tape and expense in and make the same yield. So why would I not do that? I mean, I'm in the business of selling drip tape, but I, you get to a point, you say, no, you don't need 133, do 100. You're gonna make the same number of bales that we owe on 133, I won't make as much money, but you're gonna be happier. And, and the other reason for like me, why I have or three is my minimum now on how many zones I'll water at a time. I'd rather do five at a time. I've got one I just designed in Plainview, I think that's gonna do six at a time. But the reason being because the water's falling off and I'd rather have my pressures come down and then I get in August and I just kill one zone and my pressures are back up where they're supposed to be. I'm still putting out and I've still got a good amount of water, but 
on this system, I'm designing it so I can, right now it's gonna be at 300 gallons a minute, there's 50 gallon a minute zones, but that system will still be efficient down to 35 gallons a minute. So still be able to pressure up one zone at a time at 35. And never have to dig anything up, but I'm opposed to digging if it's, it doesn't involve a ditcher or somebody else, because I don't dig. Well, that changed a lot this last year because NetFM came up with a new dripper. It's a 0.1 gallon an hour at 10 PSI. And the one I've just, I'm designing right now, it's actually a 2,500 foot run with eight feet of downhill. And I can make that with the 875 with a, about a 9% flow variation. And that's before that was gonna be the 990 and that added about $14 a thousand and it's on 40, so 14 times 13, who's got a calculator? It's 130, 170 bucks an acre. We saved you because we can use the smaller diameter tape. The 638 tape, I've got another one I'm designing that on the 638 with the same dripper instead of, used to, I could go about 700 feet, now I can go to like 11, 1150. You mean pump uphill as well? You can, but you can't go as far. Well, it's not a pressure limitation, it's a uniformity. If I'm pumped, I always want to run the tape downhill because as I'm as friction loss occurs going down the in the tape, if I'm going downhill, I'm making up for some of that friction loss because of the drop in elevation. If I'm pumping uphill, I got both sides are against me. Going up the hill is killing me because I've got that plus I've got the friction loss in the field. Now, with a, if you got a quarter section, uh, you can go. If how much slope do you have? Well, how much is a little bit? Well, I'm not going to mention names, but he no, I'm not going to go there. The guy up here, let me just put that. The guy up here told me he had a field that was flat, flat as a pancake, had no slope. I said, how do you water it? Now he goes, row water. How long are your rows? Half mile. So you water a half mile with no elevation. Yep. No. So I go out there. He never did buy the system. I think I made him mad. But I went out there and I surveyed it. And in that half mile, he had 12 feet of fall. I mean, it was flat. But this is a big part of the world, and it was flat. It was just tilted. But yeah, he had 12 feet of fall. So four feet, maybe eight. Well, this one I looked at, I was just guessing three or four feet in that fall. And then after I shot it, it was eight. Yeah. Depends on the one you're using. Yeah. So you could do a half mile just fine. Yeah. And now here's the other thing too. The uh, and I play with dripper spacings all the time because sometimes I've got more water than I need. My runs are short. I can close my spacing because you never know what'll happen. We've got so much water to get rid of, and I don't have to water all the time, so I, I can do that. Uh, I can call in if I want 18 inch dripper spacing, I can get that. I can get 20, 22, 24, 27, whatever I want, I can get the dripper spacing that I need. And in fact, I've actually had to move one out to like 25 and a half inches because that gave me the uniformity that I wanted. And you're really not gonna see the difference between 24 and 25 and a half, but you can do it. You just have to give them some lead time for a special project like that. And there better be a lot of it because they're not gonna do it for six rolls. What's plugging them? If I do that, I go find the guy that designed the system and I kick him. Well, no, but the design was a problem because he went up over a hill and he shouldn't have done that. I went to Iowa this last year for the same deal and I got hired to go teach this group how to put drip in. And I get out there and they've already plowed the tape in and they hired a guy to design it. The guy that designed it on one side, it's got a lot of downhill and it all falls back to the west put pressure compensating anti-siphon on that one. On the other field, it's got a 10 foot hill in the middle of the field, and this is only six acres. And it, from the supply side, it goes up a hill and then goes, and it, it goes down a little bit, then it goes up over this hill and then down to the fence. And it's, they put the Typhoon, which is non-pressure compensating, it's flat but not anti-siphon. So we get out there, 
and I just went out and I marked the line and brought up to the top of the hill and said, this is where your ditch is going. I'm like, but we're losing that acres. I can't help it. That's going to stop up. If you, if you try to water that, you're going to lose that whole hill. If we cut it at the top, put an air relief at the top, air vacuum relief, we're good. But if we go over the hill, we're going to lose it. So they did it, but they lost three acres. Well, three acres up there, they don't want, I mean, they plant, well, n normally it's dry land, but they're planting up to the fence line. But their land costs between eleven and $15,000 an acre for that. On 160 bushel dry land corn yields. And they want every, every square inch growing a cotton corn plant. But in that case, you just have to design it right or fix it before you finish it. Again, flow meters. Thank God the NRCS requires you to put them on drip system because now every farmer has, that has drip has at least one flow meter on their farm. This was specifically done for cotton. If you take this out, it applies on for everything. In this, in this total management system, you have to look at all of the different factors that are going to affect your yield and the ones that you can control, and all of these are them. Your planting dates, variety, plant populations, fertigation, insect control, weed control, and with cotton picks or growth regulators. I start off with the good potential of making a good yield. And I've got one guy, he's the only guy I've ever known that got fired by an agronomist. He would do nothing here. And what he ended up with every year, you couldn't tell if he was growing careless weeds or cotton. And his cotton yield, he'd never made two bales. And he had better water than most people. But it was, he couldn't compete with the weeds and he wouldn't do anything about it. And after two years, the agronomist said, I'm done. You're just not going to make it. And he didn't. Because he wouldn't do with the weeds. Well, they're not using that much. Fertigation. <laughs> This system was actually designed because of the pH of this. It's that same one with that good cotton picture earlier with my son in it. This one, the, the soil pH is pretty high, so we, we started doing some acidification. When we started it, it was feasible, but the price of the acid fertilizer we were using got too high, and we weren't seeing enough yield increase to justify it. We quit that. But we're putting everything else through the system. The NPK, we're using uh, systemic insecticides. Dicistine used to be the best. Lost the label on that. We still have dimethylate. Uh, if you put the meth weight through the system, a couple things happen. You turn the plant toxic, so the only bugs it kills is the ones that are biting, sucking, chewing, licking on your plant. It's not killing your beneficials. So your beneficial population is still thriving and growing and taking care of the resistant ones that are out there. And eventually you end up with so many beneficials that you don't ever have to do it again. You'll, unless some neighbor sprays and gets them, but you'll, you'll have a beneficial population. In fact, the first year, <coughs> I guess the second year the agronomist was here from Israel, we had one guy that was that did that, and uh, and he used disistone for aphids, and nuked them. Seventy two hours, it was they were done, and the neighbor across the road had drip also, and he sprayed. And uh, about three weeks later, the guy that sprayed was out spraying for boll worms. We didn't have them. We had too many beneficials. They were knocking them in the dirt before they could get a hold. And he saved a bunch of money. The dimethyl weight through the drip system application cost effectively zero. We put out half the labeled rate because, and that's the beauty of the drip. When you, when you get down into August and you've got that wetted ball, that root system is massed around that. And you actually have to stop thinking about irrigating a farm and start thinking about a nursery because what you've got in that dripper is a pot. And every plant's got roots in that pot. And if you want the plant to have it, all you gotta do is put it in the pot. Whether it's fertility, your insecticides, whatever that plant needs, you're putting it in that pot, just like they do in a nursery. It's just buried. And you're gonna see, like when we put the meth away, we don't stop putting nitrogen, we have a separate injector that's putting the other stuff. So the plant sitting there got this good mix of fertility and it's just sucking that water up and the nutrients and it gets that insecticide, it turns the plant toxic, 
And the other thing that's nice is reentry time. I don't know what it is on dimethylate if you spray, but if you put it through the drip system, it's zero because the plant's toxic. The plant outside is not to you. Generally, we're going to have multiple fertilizer injectors. And here's where we were doing the pH control. That was before we started injecting, and we had a pH controller on there that was actually holding our pH at about 6.8. The bad news is uh, to bring the pH from 7.8 down to 6.5 was taking 22 gallons of the product, which wasn't too bad when the product was a little over $2 a gallon, but when it got up to four something a gallon, it was, you can't justify it. And this looks really good. I'm going to germinate this field, and I got it good and wet. And that was a massive mistake. How does a chimney work? It drafts. When you, when you start pulling water off this to evaporation, the more clay you have in the soil, the worse it gets. It'll start wicking that water out of the ground. And so you just got it wet, and before you could ever plant that, it's all that water, unless you're planting as soon as the top gets dry, that moisture is going to evaporate and it's going to keep sucking. As long as that top sweat in a clay, that takes 10 days. And it's just going to keep evaporating off that surface. What you want to do is walk out there before it got to that point and scratch it a little bit and you'd see that it's wet just under that little crust on the top. That's when you stop, not there. It looks good though. People want, yeah, you can germinate in that. Just can't grow anything because you lost all your water. Maintenance, flushing the system. This is year one on a system. This is on the submain, okay? For definition's sake, the main line supplies the water to a valve assembly. From the valve assembly, then it goes into the, through the valve, and then it goes into a submain. The submain is attached to the laterals, which are attached at the other end on a flush manifold. So now we know that that's the submain. This is the flush at the end of the submain. Not many people put those out, but this is after year one. Everything you see in that thing is clay and silt that will not, that, that can all pass through the dripper. Okay, it looks horrible, but it'll pass through the dripper. But what'll kill you is if you let that stuff build up till it starts to make globs, or if you put the wrong chemical or chemicals that cause that to bond together and make mud balls, that can stop you up. The good news is if it stops up on that side of the dripper, it's easier to clean than if it's on the coming in the other side because that's the high pressure side. So let's say you've got four zones like you were talking about a minute ago. You have to flush each one of those zones, correct? Mm -hmm. How long does this flushing process take? Um, on the top end, it doesn't take very long at all because that's the supply side and it's just the length of your pipe. Yes, sir. Okay. When you're flushing your tape, uh, The first time you turn it on, it takes forever because it could take hours to get the tape blown up because you've packed it down after you put the tape in. But once you're once you're running, you can flush the system in probably in a zone probably 20 to 30 minutes easy. In some cases, it's quicker. I mean, it depends on your uh, obviously your water quality. If you're using surface water, that's an issue. But if it's just well water. Uh, you have to think about the dynamics that's going on in the drip line too. Number one, we're filtering it good so we know that everything that went through can get can go through that dripper. But every time I turn on, it's pushing that stuff down. Okay, so you end up with most of the debris in your system in that last quarter of the tape. And if when you go open the flush valve, what you'll see is you'll open the flush valve and you got clean water, it'll immediately turn nasty. And then that'll kind of fade out, then it'll get clean. And then you have to wait for it because you're going to get one more. It's going to be dirty the, the, the next time. And what that is, that's finally the stuff that's coming out of the tape. The first one was just the water was in the pipe. The second, the next, the first dose of the crud is the stuff that was in the pipeline. And once that's cleared out, you've got to wait for that last quarter to get there. And once that, then you're going to have clean water while that's happening. But as it's pushing that stuff down, then you'll get that, that uh, second round of the nasty stuff. And that one doesn't last very long because there's not that much volume in the tape. And again, every time it turns on, it drains, so it keeps moving it to the bottom end. But that's why I put them at the top end of the field also and on the main line. And 
here I'm running two at a time. You can see I just turned this one on. These are two different zones. This one's almost finished. That one's in still getting the pipeline clean. Because it, it actually, the pipeline takes a while to get clean because it's that stuff settles out in that, the whole season settling in that pipeline at the bottom which manifold. That takes the longest. Leak repair. If you see a bad leak, fix it. If you don't fix the leak when you, when you see it, every time it turns off, we like to go downhill. We, do, we put a filtration system to keep the tape and the water clean. You get a leak and you don't fix it, and every time it turns off, it's sucking all that mud down in the drip tank. It's going down the deal. And you can have some issues with that, but if you fix them, if you're proactive and get them clean, in fact, where's our drone guy? Did he leave? I want him to make a drone that drops a flag. <laughs> so you can send it out there with a bucket of flags and fly over those spots and drop a flag every pop there's a drip so preseason you get to fix them. Of course, we figured that out. He does have GPS, so you could actually go and take a picture right there and log it, and it, you'd know you can go right back out there with your phone and find those leaks. It's really, really easy. You take a piece of, uh, yeah, there's a shovel involved. Well, maybe. It depends on how bad the leak is. The bad leaks, usually you don't have to shovel them because there's a big hole. But you normally you'll take a piece of that drip tube, not the drip tube, but the hard hose that you used on the risers, and that slides inside that drip tape, and you can take that, and it actually works better if you do it while it's running. And you can take that and slide it in one end, because when it's running, because of the manifold, you got water coming out both ends. So it's clean. And every time it turns on, you get the same deal, because it keeps cleaning that, waiting for you to come fix it. But anyway, you take that and you slide it in there, and then you take a stainless steel wire tie, two wraps and an automatic puller, and you can fix them pretty quick. If you, if, if you have to dig them up, that's a whole other issue. But That's another reason. <laughs> the guys that fix very many things, maybe shallower is not that bad. <laughs> but I cheat because I always carry something with me to kneel on. And some of the packing stuff, I get uh, flow meters in. It doesn't soak up water, but it's flexible, and I'll carry the piece of that out there because it's about that thick. It's kind of soft styrofoam, and it's good on my knees, and it won't soak up water. So it's, it's perfect. But yeah, and the, what you'll find, as soon as they get the stuff back on the market for the rodents, that problem is mitigated pretty severely because the stuff actually runs them out of the ground. In fact, it's funny when you when you watch when they were doing the testing on the stuff in California, when they started injecting it, the active ingredient is mercaptan, the stuff that makes natural gas smell. But at your house, the natural gas smell is a fraction of a part per million. This is ten parts per million. And when you put that out, they the gophers they had 89 active mounds in their test area, and so the, the night before they turned that zone on, they went out and knocked those mounds down came back out the next morning and they counted 89 that had been uncovered overnight and they were still running so they didn't have any leaks and then they turned that stuff on and started injecting it and the, the gophers were coming out of the ground running away. You put that in the water? Mm -hmm. Yep, just inject it in the water. Mm -hmm. And the beauty to that is you don't typically, once you get the leaks fixed during the growing season you don't hardly see leaks because they don't like digging in the mud any more than we do. But at the end of the seasons, when you have the leak problem, well, the last right before you shut the system off is when you apply this stuff, because you're putting it out and it's below ground and be, and it doesn't really go anywhere, so it sticks around. In fact, the first one we did, we did it on Craig McCloy's, and you could still smell it in, in the next mark when we went to turn it on. You could still smell that stuff in the soil, but he went from hundreds of leaks to one, and it was a cod stalk. So that's the main culprit. Yeah, here it's rodents. Uh, I had a lot of problem with the chili folks over at Hatch because they were, what's that word? Cheap? No. Fiscally responsible. Let's use that one. And they, instead of putting 13 mil tape, they wanted to use 10 mil tape because it was cheaper. But the 10 mil tape was just thin enough that the, have you ever seen a mole cricket? Well, hang on. 
I'll get there in just a second. Check valves periodically to make the sure that's the right pressure. The valves I put in all have the ability to be adjusted and they are mechanical and springs and it's a spring in there and springs do fatigue so you'll need to go by and check those periodically. That's a good thing to do before the season starts making sure all your pressures are set correctly. Into the system flush main lines, sub mains to tape. There's line cleaners. Uh, the same company that makes that stuff makes a really, really good one that's a peroxyacetic acid, which is a peroxide and acetic acid mix. And it's a really good line cleaner. It effervesces when you put it in the drip line. And uh, I had one that was stopped up, and it wasn't even Medifin that was stopped up, but he had tried everything, couldn't do it, and I started running that stuff. And I flushed all the system out, and then I ran that stuff through there for about 30 minutes, and then I flushed the, the flush valves again on the end and got another just a lot of junk out the second time and that was out of the tape. Then I closed the valves once they were clean. I let it run another 20 minutes and somewhere in that next 20 minutes my pressure started falling and my flow started going up on the zones. And when I got done we were back where we started at the, on the drip system but it cleaned it up really, really well. Again, if line cleaners needed inject for rodent protections when it's available again, and then drain it. How long does it take for a rodent protection uh, ready? Uh, they're thinking they'll have it by the summer. Do you think they stop up when they start to make gas? Yeah, it's a, and the problem was that they, they labeled it in California. And the, somebody in the EPA in California didn't like the way the wording was on the, on the on the label, so they pulled it. I'm not going to say anything else. Okay. Big letters. That's what happens if you don't drain the water out of your system. It had water standing in it, it froze. It broke the ears off of the cyclones. Both tanks had to be replaced. These were, these cast iron caps were bent. It ex exploded. That was about a $1,400 repair. Now that said, on the cyclone, where it flushes out of the other side, on the end of that pipe, I put a two inch valve. All you have to do to flush to drain it is open that valve. That's it, just open that valve. Didn't do it. He does it now. <coughs> okay, thank you by the way. On this side, bipet damage. This guy has one guy that runs over stuff every year. This, this is what Christmas money is made out of fixing for this one guy because he runs over stuff. It's kind of like skiing, you know, if you look at a tree, you're going to ski towards it. If he sees something, he just drives at it. <laughs> and uh, have y'all ever seen PVC pipe after a water hammer? That was six inch, 80 pound pipe before the water hammer. We dug that up and I couldn't believe it. There wasn't I mean, a lot of those pieces were almost 40 feet long, but it looked like they were spiraled. I guess that extruder has a twist in it, and that it was just that shredded stuff for, I think he blew out three joints of that. It's a pocket gopher. That's our nemesis. But we have a solution for that. We're trained in prairie dogs. But actually, what we found, and they started doing this in the Midwest, putting up these barn owl boxes. And this is a specific box for barn owls. It's kind of nice because the back side, you can take it out and clean it. It's made out of poly, and you, you basically load it with a little bark mulch in there to get them to, to replace the nest. And they tried to overdo it on one field year before last, and they put 20 boxes out on, in this one farm. And 15 of them ended up with breeding pairs in the boxes. Now you take 15 pairs, that's 30 owls, 
eating three mice a night. That's 90 a night. What's that in the summer? But the, in their test, they cheated, though, and they put cameras in their boxes. And what they found was, because owls are night hunters, gophers will come out of the ground at night. And about 40% of what they were getting out of the field were gophers. And that's amazing. But, yeah, and you don't have to have this one. You can go online and the Audubon Society actually has plans for making specific to barn owls. Because it has to be specific because if you build it wrong, you know, we don't have a problem with great horned owls here, but they're territorial and you can't have one of those one of those pairs for every couple of miles probably. But these, in a farm, they had 15, they're real social, they don't care. And they'll clean up close to them and then they'll move out and help your neighbors out too. But if you run the numbers when they're feeding and feeding babies, what numbers that works out to be in a year, that's amazing. That's in the thousands of, of rodents. That's the mole cricket. And what they do is they rub on the, on the drip tape and it makes little holes in that tin mill. Little pinholes. I mean, you go out there and you can see there's just a little bitty wet spot and you dig down and it's just, it's usually on the side of the drip tape. There's no real seam on it, but because it was put on the deal, when it's, even when it's not on, it's kind of off oval and right there on the edges where they'll rub on it with their, with their legs and they end up with holes in it. So what do you do to control them? Demethylate. Yep. The trick is, you know, you got to know you got them, and then you can do that. And it, and the same thing happens with uh, we, have the experiment station. The first one we put in over there on corn, we had, I, f I bet we fixed 200 leaks on 10 acres. And my guy told me, I said, well, how many leaks have you fixed? He goes, ah, a couple of hundred. I said, start saving all the leaks. So he starts saving them. Well, I got a digital microscope. So after I got, after he brought them to me, I looked at them and I. Well, that's a wire worm. And wire worm looks, looks like something out of, of uh, tremors. It's got a mouth on one end with a bunch of teeth and a little short worm. And they'll go down and they get on top of that drip line and you can see the chew marks and they make just a little pinhole in the top of the drip tape. And it's just a pinhole, but it's enough. But uh, it's labeled for that for corn. And that, this is on corn research, so you can just put that out for corn rootworm, get rid of the, get rid of the wire worms too. Root intrusion, permanent crops, buried in orchards, in vineyards, and in grass crops. If you're growing alfalfa, or I've got some guys growing timothy, and like the guy in Idaho that's in that rotation, any permanent crop that's going to be an issue, and it really likes to grow into the dripper. You can see how that masked around that drip tape. The solution for this, how much is trifluralin? It's cheap. It takes a half ounce to the acre if the tape is on 40 to keep this from happening every 60 days. But every 60 days, that's the half-life. You have to do it every 60 days. And at a half ounce to the acre, it's going to make about a golf ball sized spot around that dripper that roots won't grow into because of the chemical that's there. And as soon as it comes out of the dripper, it'll immediately tie up in the clay that's in the soil. So it doesn't move, it's not going to hurt your crop, but it, like in this case, it keeps it out. Netafem, for their landscape stuff, they used to actually make a, a filter disc that was impregnated with trifluralin. So that every time you're irrigating, it was putting out a little bit of trifluralin, not enough to affect plant growth because they did it specifically for yards, and you'd never see it in the yard, but you didn't have to worry about roots growing in it. And then uh, the trifluralin is still labeled for injection, but they got tired of messing with that, so now what they're doing is the, on the stuff they use for landscape, they're, it's a, there's actually a, it's a, a copper clad in that outlet bath where the water comes out. The copper, the roots won't grow in there. That's what roots look like going through a dripper. And I fixed one in Big Spring when I started flushing it out. You have to go through the right process to get roots because the roots have a waxy surface on the outside and you gotta get that wax off. You start that with chlorine. You bring your chlorine down to about 10 parts per million and oxidize that waxy surface off and then follow that up with that the reacted acid like the enfuric. 
you don't want to get too hot with it, but you can then inject that, and once you've got that waxy surface off, it'll burn those roots. But you need to wait until the roots of the plant senesce, so the roots are going to be drier, and you can burn it out and get it out pretty easy. But the first one I did, I couldn't believe it. I was getting just looked like big wads of spaghetti coming out of the drip tubing. And the dug one up, and the roots had not only grown through the dripper, they went out through the inlet of the dripper, and the, the drip line was had that stuff on it. <laughs> roots everywhere. can't remember which product. I think this was I don't remember. But you can see the roots in there. And that's one of those real thin, real wide, real thin. Another problem is manganese. Manganese and iron, if you've got those in the water, that's an issue because it will uh, precipitate out in the dripper line. When you have those, you typically also have the associated iron bacteria or bacteria, and that creates a, a slime that'll stop up the drip system. This is a, a manganese. That's what the back of the dripper looked like. You can clean this up, but you're going to have to use number one peroxide, bring the pH down with acid, then inject peroxide. We actually figured that out. Uh, Jim Berdosky was looking at it, and it was an old soils book in how to solubilize a manganese sample out of soil so that you could see what the manganese level in the soil was, and that was the solution, was bring the pH down and then use hydrogen peroxide. We also found out, because you need to get flow through that dripper, that if we put a wetting agent in there like wicks, that makes the water molecules smaller, it's easier to get flow through there, and you have to have contact to make it Iron, same thing. We have some stuff that we're actually testing right now. It's a, it's an oxidizer, but it. The only way I can really describe it is it's a flash oxidizer. It it oxidizes it almost on contact, and it, it makes very very small particles. And we've been trying it, and they make uh, a filter that actually will pull it out. It's there's a new product, but the old product was potassium for mangan. It actually attaches itself and it grabs that stuff out of solution. Well, they had one of those filters in there when they would flow. Anyway, so they took this product and they were injecting it two parts per million, and they injected upstream of the of the tank. And it's not potassium for mangan. I can't remember what the new product is, but that they put in a media tank. But it went from flushing out red to flushing out nothing. It wasn't even stopping it up once they injected this stuff at two parts per million. Well, then they also found out it fixes, it solves a lot of problems if you've got organics like uh, uh, lake water. That one I showed you that's in sugar cane, we're actually injecting that at two parts per million all the time to keep the organics down in that system. But if this, they're still in the test works of the stuff, but at two parts per million, that is dirt cheap, and that opens up a whole other range of markets. Anybody along the Mississippi River, the Brazos River, that whole Brazos Valley is prime ready for drip except for the iron in the water. This fixes that. If it, if it continues and we get some good test results, this will be a good thing. But, uh, and the other one is they had some problems in a, in a nursery, and I don't have that picture on here either, I couldn't get it off my phone. But they, on tomatoes, they were injecting it, they've got very drip on, on benches and tomatoes. And what they, and then they've got plastic on it. Well, they pulled the plastic up, and the one they injected it on, it's just a solid mass of roots along under that plastic. And on the one that, that wasn't injected, there's the roots are pretty sporadic, but there's, you know, it's still good roots, but sporadic. But the uh, tomatoes with the stuff injected make 50% more tomatoes. And it's, I don't know what the, what the, I'm not that deep into the weeds and the stuff yet. But they also have a powdered product that is organic and it's labeled organic. This is one of those chemicals that they missed the, uh, the label was wrong. They changed the label and that's what it caused in the dripper, that slime. This is the lady who thought her filter was flushing too often so she took the discs out. That sand, that's hard to get out. Bacterial slime. Again, surface water application. The worst one I've ever seen, though, I was in, in, over near Pecos, and they were 
irrigating and they called me and they said something's wrong I've got way too much pressure and I can't get the flow so I go down there and I go to the flush valve and I try to open it well, I get it open and nothing so I left it open well here in a minute this stuff starts coming out because it's under pressure and a lot of pressure and it was this nasty stinkingest green brown stuff kept coming out and falling off and I'm sitting there kind of digging through it and it was tadpoles so once we got it flushed out, I went back and had them open up their filter. There was no sand in it. They had flushed all their sand out the year before. And when they got to the end of the season, they wanted to pump the tank down. So they pumped that earthen pond down and they sucked it full of about a million frog eggs. And they all hatched in that drip line incubator below ground. And that's what was in the system. That was easy to clean up, but it didn't stink. Again, good design, crops, row spacing, equipment spacing. I like to, I always like to ask the question. It doesn't always happen, but if I can, I like to put equipment where it's out of your way. Like the guys that are going to farm it across the tape, I want to make sure I measure, get their equipment measured. Worst case scenario, when I move all that stuff out, just pass that so they can miss it. Thank God for GPS now because it's easier to miss. And again, dripper flow rate and spacing and topography. Topography is a big one I've been running into lately because it's not here. And again, system capacity, available water supply, well water, surface water, wastewater. I'm running systems on dairy waste. I'm running them on uh, feedlot waste. And as long as you get the water clean and you can treat for the, you know, for the organics in the water, you can minimize your fertilizer bill. But you always want to mix. First thing I learned, the solution to pollution is dilution. So when you're pumping that water, you never want to have it just that water. You want to put, you know, at least 70% fresh water with that. But don't cross-contaminate. System that was done over here over at Sunray for, uh, I don't know if y'all know Junior Anduho. This was the first block he put in to see if it was going to work. This is the second block he put in when he figured out it did work. And you can see the contour lines here. But I cheated when I designed because I shot the whole thing the first time. And I, so when I went back, I, w I had the whole thing already designed so it all fits together like a. But drip is like Legos. As long as you don't design yourself in the corner, you can keep adding on. You don't have to do it all at one time. And that makes it really nice. And then here is the one here at the station that we put in. We cheated over here because they thought they might want to do some 30s. Everything is on 30s, but they thought they might want to do some 60s here for some research. And I didn't want to do it because everybody I've known that has 60s is, wants to go to 30s. So I actually put in a 60. This, the one zone, this whole thing is one zone, and it's on 60. Or it's two zones. It's one zone if you run both valves at the same time, and then it's all on 30s. So it's either 30s or 60s, depending on whether they're going to do research on it or not. Have y'all ever done any? Who's not here? Oh. Curtis in here. I was going to. Again, USDA forms. This is the number I'm looking for on flow variation. I want these numbers as low as possible. I was actually driving home one day, and that was happening just north of Abernathy, and I pulled over, and it started off, it was just looked like kind of a column, but then it started sucking up dirt off that guy's field. And I sat there and watched that deal for probably 30 minutes and videotaped most of it, and then when it got done, there was a haboob that was all the way, I got behind it and followed it all the way to Lubbock, and it all came off that guy's field. Any marketing majors in here? <laughs> This is an actual place in Missouri. That's bad enough. What about this? <laughs> Gun range and rentals. <laughs> and in all things, stuff happens. Any questions? What's the life expectancy? <sighs> Can I quote the experts? Meryl Streep, Ted Danson, Whoopi Goldberg. Buried polyethylene in a landfill lasts forever. The oldest system that I know that's currently still working was put in in 1980. 
The drip lines today are way better than they were in 1980. The drippers are better. The poly is better. Uh, What's your biggest advancement? Uh, you, you talked about better. And so wh when did those advancements happen? And where do you, well, what's it's the most recent? The, 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 the most recent is the point one dripper. And they've got one that's maybe lower than that. And that changed, again, that's a game changer because that brings the, the cost down. Because when I go to a point one dripper, I just reduced the number of appurtenances, the number of valves, the flush valves, and all that stuff by 40%. That's huge. That's huge. On the same amount of water, I can still just water the same amount of acres. I just have to water longer. But that's good because in order to put the right amount of water on without losing water out the bottom, in a sand because it it moves too fast if you get it uh, above field capacity, and in a clay because it can't take it very fast. In both cases, water moves down. The lower the flow dripper, you can actually get to the point that you can almost match the consumption of the plant, and that's that's huge. In fact, one of the dumbest things I ever saw was one of the smartest things I ever have been able to help people with. Uh, an agronomist with Netafim decided he was going to work on a system for Africa where they don't have power and they need food and that kind of thing. So he developed this system where he actually built a platform that's two meters high. It's got a barrel on it. They used the disposable drip tape, comes on 11,000 feet on a roll for uh, the vegetable industry. And they put it and they built a hoop house. And they put this stuff and they buried it in a clay soil about an inch deep. And then the only pressure it's got is that barrel. Now, this, the drip tape is disposable. They don't care if it stops up. It does have a filter coming out of the tank. But they bucket the water because they don't have power. So they bucket the water into the tank. They mix. He's taught them how to make compost tea, brewing the, the livestock waste and stuff to make the nutrients to put in the system. And when they bury it, well, what happens is because that dripper starts dripping and wetting up that clay, the osmotic pressure, when it reaches a certain point, there's less head than the osmotic pressure, and the dripper quits dripping. So it quits using water, OK? Now think about this. So now you go plant all your different okras and your green beans and all this stuff in there. Well, now as that plant begins to use that moisture out of there, that particular plant is determining what that dripper space is or what that dripper flow is. If it's a higher, higher consumptive use plant, it drips more. If it's a lower consumptive use plant, it drips less. And so there's no automation in this thing, and they're growing in greenhouses. And a friend of mine took that to Africa with his church. Uh, they've adopted a nurse or an orphanage, and they put that in the orphanage, and they're growing vegetables enough now that they're selling vegetables. And it's cheap. Thank you all. <coughs> that wasn't so Aggie, by the way. Thing, uh, okay, I'm going to put in a 100 acre system. I know they're going to ask us, the one that has the what's it going to cost? Is it under a pivot? Is it under a pivot? Is it in a, so is it a square? Is, is it a perfect square? Or wherever you want. Oh, let's say it's square. Say it's square? Say it's square. 100 acres. How much water? 30 inch spacing. How much water do I have? Oh, well, 100, 400 gallons. 400 gallons a minute. It's going to run three, four. It's going to run. Right now on 30s, it's probably going to cost about $2,000, $2,100. Okay. 